Well, member for Halliburton, Cortha Lakes, Brock. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in the House today to speak to Bill C-29, the National Council for a Reconciliation Act. So, Speaker, this bill is the government's attempt after six and a half years to address the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action numbers 53 through 56. Indeed, since 2015, the Liberal government, for all their rhetoric on reconciliation, have only fully implemented 11 out of the 94 calls to action and only eight of the 76 calls that actually fall under their jurisdiction. Speaker, Bill C-29 is long overdue and the rush by this government to implement something has produced a flawed bill. If we are to continue down the path of reconciliation with Indigenous people, a robust and inclusive response to calls, act, calls to action 53 to 56 are needed. And unfortunately, this government has failed to produce that response. Bill C-29 provides a framework for the implementation of a National Council for a Reconciliation, but the foundation is cracked and will need some care and attention at committee if the government hopes to provide a workable council that is respected by all Indigenous leaders, communities and organizations across Canada. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommended that the government establish a National Council for Reconciliation in Calls to Action number 53. Bill C-29 addresses this through the creation of a not-for-profit corporation with between 9 and 13 members who will monitor and report the progress of the government on their efforts for reconciliation with Indigenous people. The Council will not be an agent of His Majesty in the Right of Canada, nor is it governed by the Financial Administration Act. It is, in every practical sense, an independent body, or at least it should be. Here we find the first of several issues I have with Bill C-29. How independent will this Council be if the members of the board are picked by the Minister of a Crown Indigenous Relations? The Act stipulates that the first board of directors will be selected by the Minister in, quote, collaboration with the Transitional Committee. But let's not forget that the transi Transitional Committee was selected by the Minister in December of 2021. So why is this important? Well, first, the board will have the vital task of establishing the Articles of Incorporation and other founding documents that set aside how future boards will be elected and who will constitute a member. In other words, the minister and his hand-picked transitional team will determine the future of this so-called independent council, whose job includes taking the minister to task over their failed record on reconciliation. Call to action number 54 calls on the government to provide multi-year funding for the National Council. The government did so in Budget 2029 through the allocation of $126.5 million. Yet the Act does not require any accountability on the expenditure of this money, and not one financial report needs to be filed by the Council. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission recognized the importance that relevant and timely information be provided to the Council for it to actually do its work. This was enshrined in call to action number 55, where all levels of government are required to provide annual reports and current data on a wide range of areas related to Indigenous matters, including but not limited to child care, education, health, incarceration rates, criminality and victimization rates. It would be interesting to hear from provincial and municipal authorities how they are able to implement this requirement. I hope, for the Council's sake, that a lot of the work to streamline these requests has already taken place between the Crown Indigenous Relations Ministry, including Northern Affairs Canada, and their provincial counterparts. I also hope that there will not be any undue burdens placed on our already taxed municipal governments with respect to extra reporting requirements. Call to Action 56 calls on the government in fact, the Prime Minister, to formally respond to the report by issuing a State of Indigenous Peoples report that outlines the government's reconciliation plans. Bill C-29 utterly fails here, designating the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations to make the response rather than the Prime Minister. Speaker, one of the most glaring issues with C-29 is the lack of representation 
on the National Council for Reconciliation. The bill sets aside three seats for the AFN, the ITK, and the MNC, three national organizations that the Liberal government almost exclusively deals with when it comes to Indigenous issues. Yet they are not the only national Indigenous organizations in Canada. In fact, large swaths of urban and poor people are ignored. There is no representation of women or children designated on the Council. There is no acknowledgement of the work of the on-the-ground community organizations that do the work day in and day out for Indigenous people. The Liberals will argue that those organizations could get elected by the membership. And sure, yes, they could. But why do some organizations get guaranteed spots and not others? Why have important national organizations like the Native Women's Association of Canada, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, or the National Association of Friendship Centres been designated as second-class organizations by this government? Where are the other Métis and indigenous, indigenous Voices? What about organizations focused on the important work of economic reconciliation? I often hear in, in meetings, Speaker, with Indigenous leaders about the importance of economic reconciliation, not to address their own issues with their own resources, but also to return to a self of self-sufficiency and honour to a people that have had, had it stripped away by a paternalistic, archaic and irreparably broken Indian Act. Speaker, if the Government of Canada is serious about true reconciliation, we, we need to address the elephant in the room. I believe that we need to immediately and in partnership with Indigenous leaders do a comprehensive review of the Indian Act with the intent of removing the legislative barriers to participation in Canada's economy and develop a long-term plan to fully transition away from the Indian Act. Some Indigenous communities speaker are already there. Some are in the process and some are not ready for that conversation. That is why a cautious approach to support the abolition of the Indian Act by providing these Indigenous communities who are prepared for self-government with the legislative avenues to do so while also ensuring that a robust and national dialogue on the plan for what is next is held inclusively with Indigenous and not Indigenous people. Ensuring that any new legislation is based on consultation relating to autonomy, taxation, transparency, accountability and property rights. At the same time, Speaker, it's my belief that we need to establish a national dialogue with Indigenous leadership and organizations to remove the bureaucratic barriers to economic prosperity that exist at Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations in Northern Affairs Canada, with the goal of phasing out these government bureaucracies altogether. There is no reason why Indigenous communities and organizations cannot deal directly with finance or health or any other government entity without consulting the gatekeepers at those two ministries. We need to modernize land treaty system to initiate economic prosperity for Indigenous communities and to provide the tools for Indigenous communities to determine their own destiny while balancing the rights of Canada, ensuring the need for certainty and finality of terms and so not to impede the overall governance of the nation and to provide future certainty for governments, industry and Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. The existing model of federal public service determining who is and who isn't ready for self-government needs to change. Reconciliation must be centered on the future of Indigenous people, not what is in the best of this Liberal government. By modernizing our approach to Indigenous partnerships through the eventual abolition of the Indian Act, we modernize Canada. And we usher in a new age of economic prosperity and equality for opportunity. Bill C-29, which disregards the important council of organizations devoted to Indigenous people, women and children's issues, urban poor, First Nations and self-sufficiency and equality is a symptom of a much larger issue. And Speaker, Conservatives support reconciliation with Indigenous people and we are ready to have that conversation. Thank you, Speaker. Questions and comments?